Amen. Let's bow, please. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for this time in your presence. We thank you for your word that you have shared to us today through your apostle Peter. We pray, O oh God, that as we reflect upon your word through him, that you would enlighten our hearts and our minds, that you would open us up to the revelation you would have for each one of us here today. Please, O oh God, inspire us all. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your glorious sight, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. In the awesome and holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. One day a man left snowy Chicago for a vacation in sunny Miami. His wife was on a business trip and planning to meet him there in Miami the next day. Well, after arriving in Miami, the man sent his wife an email. But he missed one letter and mistakenly sent that email to an elderly preacher's wife whose husband had died only the day before. Well, when the grieving widow checked her email, she fainted and fell to the floor. And her family rushed in to check on her and see what, everything, what was going on and everything. And, and, and on that computer screen, this is what they read. My dearest wife just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> P.S. It's much, much hotter down here than I ever imagined. <laughs> Some days are better than others, right? I mean, can we all agree on that? Yes. Yeah, some days are. Some days are better than others, right? Like. But you know something? I, after researching the passage for today, 1 Peter 1, 1 to 9, as bad as our days may be, and, and it really, I, I don't know everything that you go through, you don't know everything I go through, but as bad as our days may be, literally, they are nothing, nothing, nothing compared to the brutal days of the early Christians, of the early church. They're nothing, really. The Apostle Peter knew that firsthand. He, he, he lived during that time. He wrote these people during that time. And that's why he wrote them this word of encouragement that we read this morning. It's a letter to not just one church, but several churches. The church, they, they were located in what is now present-day Turkey. And what they did with this letter that Peter wrote is they would pass it along from church to church to church. Remember all these different churches we read right off the bat? They would all receive this letter, one after another, after another, after another. It was written about 64 AD, and that's important to remember, because that's when Rome was ruled by a ruthless dictator named Nero. Now, why do I call Nero ruthless? Well, in the year 64 A.D., two-thirds of the city of Rome was burned to the ground. Two-thirds of it. We're talking about those incredible libraries full of, of all kinds of wonderful houses, farms, everything demolished, burned to the ground. And it was obvious to almost everybody that Nero himself had done it. He needed a scapegoat. He needed somebody to blame. Who do you think he blamed? He blamed the Christians, the early Christians. And that is what precipitated, that is what began years of brutal, sadistic persecution of Christian believers. The historian Tacitus tells us that Nero lived in a palace not far off the main road in Rome where it was common for him to tie Christians, obviously alive, still alive, tie them to poles just outside of his house, where at night he would set them on fire and then casually walk out to the street and talk to passers-by going this way and that as if nothing behind him was happening. That's how demonic this man was. 
I'm going to share a few more things. During his rule, Christians were also fed to the lions of the Colosseum. Others were stoned to death. Some were beheaded. Some were dismembered. Some were crucified. Some were boiled alive in oil. Some were thrown off of cliffs. And some were condemned to underground mines. Underground mines where they were forced to live the rest of their lives in complete darkness. If you were a professing Christian at the time Peter wrote this letter, you were hunted down like a wild animal. You were imprisoned or tortured or killed or sometimes all three. These are the people to whom Peter is writing. Please don't forget that. It is highly probable that both Peter and Paul died as martyrs under the rule of this madman Nero. And it was in the face of all of this brutal persecution, once again, that Peter wrote what we read and read what we read and heard today. He wrote this letter to people who had little hope of staying alive. Why? Because they refused to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Well, they had opportunities to, 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 to get out of the whole thing, but no, 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 these people were going to their deaths because of their faith. So Peter's writing this letter to these people in this type of situation, but rather than focusing on their persecution, he focuses on God's promises to them. Rather than focusing on their trials, Peter focuses on their triumph. He writes, quote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an eternal inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. <coughs> Let me say that last part one more time. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Now, brothers and sisters, that's what these people needed to hear. That's what these people needed to know. That even in the face of death, which for, the, for many, if not most of them, was almost a certainty, they could still have joy beyond words. Why? Because of what awaited them just around the corner. And what awaited them just around the corner? The joy of heaven. The joy of heaven. A heaven so beautiful, so wonderful, so glorious, so amazing, so perfect, that in Peter's words, it's inexpressible. There are no words in the human language, in, in, in the human language, not just the English language, in any language. There are no words to express the glory of heaven. Can't do it. Even Peter knew that. The joy of heaven is something we just can't explain. Brothers and sisters, please know this. Peter's words to those early Christians are his words to us today. God's words to us today, right here, right now. They were written for us as much as they were written for that initial group of people in various cities. So, when life gets tough, when life, life beats us down, and it does sometimes, when life is a real struggle, Let's remember something important that Peter tells us here, God through Peter, and that is the pain is only temporary. <coughs> it's only temporary. It won't last. And when it's gone, it's gone. But what isn't gone, 
and never will be, but will always remain, is what awaits us just around the corner. Just around Not long. Won't be long. And that is a life so majestic, so beautiful, so perfect, again, even Peter himself couldn't put it into words. An existence so magnificent, so magnificent, once we get there, we wouldn't want to come back if we could. And that, brothers and sisters, is what awaits all of us right around the corner. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren writes the following. It is vital that you stay focused on God's plan, not your pain or problem. That is how Jesus endured the pain of the cross, and we are urged to follow his example. The secret to endurance is to remember that your pain is temporary, but your reward is eternal. Moses endured a life of problems because he was looking ahead to his reward. Paul endured hardship the same way. In Romans 8.18 he says, quote, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In other words, compared to heaven, which is right around the corner for all of us, the trials of this life are nothing at all. They're not even worth mentioning. People of faith, God's message to us today is this. When life is beating us up, when we feel like we have more problems than solutions, when all seems to be lost, and we feel like the world is against us, do not give up. Don't, please. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give in to short-term thinking. Stay focused on the end result. Stay focused on what's just around the corner. Keep your eyes on the prize. It won't be long. It won't be. Let me read to you some of the promises that God has made to you and me. And we all know that God can't break a promise. Why can't He? Well, John 14, 6, Jesus, who was God Himself walking on the face of this earth, God Himself said, I am the way and the truth, right? And the life. God is the truth defined. The truth can't lie. The truth is the truth. The truth is the opposite of a lie. When God makes a promise, He keeps it 100% of the time. These are some of His promises. Receive them. Take them with you. John 14, 1-2, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in Me. In My Father's house there are many dwelling places. Many. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's another one of his promises. John chapter 11, 25-26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet shall they live. And those who live and believe in me will finish it. Never die. Life to life. That's God's promise. John chapter 14, 18, and 19, Christ says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long. The world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Not may, not might, will live. And of course, while Jesus was on the cross, just moments before he breathed his last, he turned his head toward a repentant thief. And he said to that repentant thief, he said, truly, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. The point is this. We get
get through today by looking forward to tomorrow, no matter what it is. And it can be as tough as tough can be. We get through today by looking forward to tomorrow. A tomorrow which far outweighs any trial or hurt, any pain or problem we may face today. Any of them. All of them. Just ask Johnny Erickson Todd. <coughs> Most of us have heard about her. I'll just share a little bit of the story. Due to a diving accident, Johnny has been a quadriplegic for the past 56 years. She has no hope of ever, ever moving her arms or her legs ever again on this side of eternity. Now you think a person in a situation like that, a person who was tragically and crippled some 56 years ago in the prime of her life, a person who since as a teenager has not been able to climb a mountain or swim in a pool or go for a walk, or ride a bike, or dress herself, or feed herself, or comb her hair, or brush her teeth, or put on her makeup. None of those things that some of us take for granted, all of us take for granted sometimes. You think a person in that type of situation for that length of time would have a tendency just to give up, wouldn't you? But not her. During the many years of her painful rehabilitation, Johnny taught herself to draw and paint, holding a pen or a brush between her teeth. Then she wrote a book about her life, which was made into a movie. She has even organized a national ministry to help those who suffer called Johnny and Friends. And get this. Once when she was at a Christian conference for women, one of the women walked up to her and said, Johnny, you always look so together, so happy in your wheelchair. I wish that I had your joy. How do you do it? And Johnny replied, I don't do it. In fact, may I tell you how I woke up this morning? And then she breathed deeply and said, this is an average day for me. After my husband, Ken, leaves for work at 6 a.m., I am alone until I hear the front door open at 7 a.m. That's when a friend arrives to get me up. While I listen to her make coffee, I pray, Oh Lord, my friend will soon give me a bath, get me dressed, sit me up in my chair, brush my teeth, comb my hair, give me breakfast, I don't have the strength to face this routine one more time, Lord. I have no resources. I don't have a smile to take into this day. But you do. You do, God. May I have yours, God? I need you desperately. And then the woman asks, so what happens when your friend comes, when your friend comes through, the bedroom, through the bedroom door? And Johnny said, I turn my head toward her and give her a smile sent straight from heaven. It's not mine. It's God's. And then gesturing to her paralyzed legs, she said, Whatever joy you see today was hard won this morning. It's the only way to live. It's the, it's the Christian way to live. And then she said this, if you're going through a difficult time right now, and it's beyond your power to smile, remember, beneath the surface where nobody else can see, there is an inexpressible joy that is available to each of us. It is the joy of the resurrected Christ. Ask Him to give you His joy, His joy. So that even if that smile never makes it to your face, it will still reside in your heart. May you receive His joy this day. That's essentially the message that Peter was trying to get across to those persecuted Christians so many years ago. That's what God through Peter is trying to tell us today, sisters and brothers. 
please, 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 never forget, no matter what it is. Our joy, our joy is found in the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's where our joy is found. Because He lives, we shall live also. Because He has risen, we will one day rise as well. That is His promise. And that is ours to keep forever and evermore. Knowing that, remembering that, living that truth is where true joy will always, always, always be there. After communion today, we're going to close with a powerful hymn. A hymn that coattails on everything that we have read from God's Word today and what has been expressed through me. And that hymn says this, When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. The victory. The victory. And the children of God say, Amen. Amen.